So thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to this fantastic meeting. I learned a lot. And thank you also for the audience because I'm the last speaker and you stayed on to the bitter end. I'm very grateful for that. And uh, so um, how do I control this? Uh, uh, ah, here, here. Right. Uh, Ah, okay, right, right. So, uh, so I'm interested in uh, in uh, prion toxicity, and I want to start uh, with uh, uh, just you know. Uh, there are, uh, I think that we can really separate two different um, uh, phases. One is really prion replication, and that I have decided many years ago to stay away from. But then it's not really obvious how the aggregation of prions really damages uh, cells, and this damage is dramatic. I mean, prions, I mean, if you look at, uh, uh, at the brain of a patient with uh, terminal Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, the cortex is completely destroyed, and in a very short period of time. So the idea is that there is something that, that uh, there is an intrinsic toxicity to prions that is much higher than for many other neurodegenerative diseases. And I want to remind you of an experiment that actually we did 30 years ago with Sebastian Brandner. That was my first postdoc. And essentially what Sebastian did at that time was to take a PRP knockout mouse, which cannot de- be infected with prions, uh, and uh, transplant a piece of brain that expresses uh, the, pre- the normal prion protein and then infect this. And what he found was, uh, you see here, this uh, spongiform encephalopathy, these huge vacuoles that blow up in the, in the neural tissue. However, the surroundings were hardly affected at all. And uh, although the prions uh, have uh, happily transmigrated into the surroundings, so this already suggested to us uh, that it is really the normal prion protein, that is a GPI-linked protein on the surface of the neuron that is necessary to transduce the toxicity. Now, uh, uh, over time, we try to do many things to counteract this. And one thing we did was uh, to make a bunch of antibodies. And uh, this was the work of Frank Heppner, also more than 20 years ago, who showed, actually, that you can express antibodies against the normal prion protein, and can, you can block the toxicity of prions. So, so that was already pretty um, um, exciting. Uh, but. Uh, And, you know, we thought, okay, now we have a cure and everybody will become rich and famous. It didn't happen. And, uh, uh, well, it didn't happen because one of the things that we found is that uh, some of these anti-prion antibodies are super toxic. The antibodies themselves, uh, and uh, this was the work of Tiziana Sonati also 10 years ago, who showed that, for example, an antibody against uh, the prion protein that is called POM1. By the way, this antibody was made by Magda Polimenido when she was a PhD student in my lab. And uh, POM, and that's why it's called POM, and POM1 uh, uh, destroys uh, sli- cerebellar slices. So you can see here, this is a cross-section through a cerebellar organotypic slice. You see here beautifully the granule cells, the Purkinje cells uh, that we have just, uh, uh, it's not as beautiful as the picture you saw before, but it's also nice. And, uh, and, but you see that uh, the POM1 destroys all of this. And uh, I wanted to understand how this works. And then I got together with uh, Michael James, uh, who made the, some co-crystals of POM1 together with the prion protein, and my hope was that this might show that the prion protein may denature or somehow be um, uh, uh, distorted, but this did not happen. So, so at this point, we were kind of stuck. And then uh, uh, it was really Luca Varani at the Instituto di Ricerche Biomedica in Bellinzona who told me, well, why don't we look at this by molecular dynamic simulation? Because the crystal structure doesn't tell you really what happens uh, to the proteins over time. And And indeed, uh, uh, the molecular dynamics showed that that these two parts of the prion protein are pretty far apart from each other. But when POM1 comes in, then there is a lot of uh, uh, hydrogen bonds uh, that make a network here. And these these two residues come very close to each other, and they lock. They lock, and you see it here. Now, the, the diameter of these tubes indicate uh, the oscillations of uh, the prion protein. And what you see is that this part here is pretty flexible. It oscillates. However, when POM1 comes in, then everything here becomes very stiff and compensatory. This part here becomes much more uh, flexible. So the question then was, okay, it, does this have anything to do with the toxicity? And uh, this was then the work um, for, of... Um, um, 
Karl Fronsek, who thought, okay, I mean, then let's make a mutant of POM1 that binds to the same epitope, but is unable to create what I call the hydrogen latch. So this hydrogen latch between these two residues. So, uh, um, so uh, what Carr did was an alanine scan of both the heavy chain and the light chain of the antibody in order to find mutants that would retain the affinity and yet not induce the hydrogen latch. And uh, he found for several of these, and uh, now I'm talking about this tyrosine 104 into alanine uh, mutant. Uh, and uh, now you, this is the molecular dynamic simulation that shows how much time the prion protein uh, um, keeps in the, in the hydrogen less simulation, uh, uh, situation. And you see it's actually very little. If you put POM1, then everything, uh, so uh, the protein all, is almost always in the latch conformation. However, if you put in the mutant POM1, now the mutant POM1 prevents, it, uh, it uh, leads to a selective population of the, um, uh, of the non latch conformation. So what happens when you give uh, the mutant POM1 to slices? Uh, here, uh, these are uh, the is a cerebellar organotypic slices, and you see here beautifully the granocell layer. Uh, now, if you give POM1, everything is destroyed within a couple of days. However, the mutant POM1 is non-toxic. Now, this may not tell you much, but the real exciting thing comes here. Uh, here, uh, we are being uh, given uh, prions, Rocky Mountain laboratory strain of uh, mouse prions, uh, to slices, and you see here that uh, the prions uh, uh, destroys the slice. However, in the presence of the mutant POM1, the slice uh, is, um, is, not, is not damaged. So this shows that preventing the latch conformation prevents the toxicity of, the, um, uh, of uh, bona fide infectious prions. So can we actually corroborate this? Uh, so when, then we thought, okay, can we actually induce the latch, the hydrogen latch, in some other way? One thing we did was to put in two cysteines exactly at these residues in order to create a, a latched conformation, a rigidified conformation in the absence of the antibody. So if the, the, uh, um, if the prediction is correct, this should actually be toxic. And this was the, the, then the, the, this mutant, this dicystein mutant was packed into an adeno-associated virus. And what we see here is that the di dicystein mutant versus the normal prion protein is transduced into Purkinje cells, uh, and you see it beautifully. However, after 30 days, uh, uh, the normal prion protein is still expressed, uh, whereas the dye system mutant has killed the Purkinje cells. So, so in organotypic slices, uh, just simply creating a uh, rigidifying this part suffices to, um, uh, to, uh, to, damage, uh, to damage the Purkinje cells. And now the, the final question was, can we do this in vivo? And for that, uh, we made uh, an, ad uh, an adeno-associated virus virus with a mutant, with a non-toxic mutant, and we inject it into brains. And the MRI already shows you that uh, the whole, the original POM1, the toxic antibody, cre uh, immediately creates uh, uh, damage into the brain. You can see actually the edema in the hippocampus within a couple of hours. Uh, and if you actually look at what happens uh, to the brain, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, necrosis and destruction that goes on in the hippocampus, uh, whereas the mutant antibody is non-toxic. Uh, but now the nice thing is that uh, now uh, uh, this, uh, this is an adeno-associated virus that will find its way into the brain. Uh, it is a, one of those serotypes that you can inject into the tail vein and it will find the way into the neurons. It's very effective. It was made by Matt Holt at the VIB in, um, in Leuven. And now e uh, each one of these mice makes uh, different levels of the mutant protein. But if you correlate the survival after prion infection with the amount of uh, antibody that is made, it correlates pretty well. So the more uh, mutant antibodies these mice make, the longer they live after prion infection. So we believe that this is pretty strong evidence uh, that uh, this hydrogen latch is really one of the crucial uh, conformational changes in the prion protein that drive toxicity. Be, uh, mind you, I'm talking about toxicity, I'm not talking about aggregation. That is a different thing. Now, um, how does uh, the toxicity go on? Well, uh, we have found a couple of years ago that actually that the normal prion protein interacts uh, with a G, couple, G protein coupled receptor called GPR126 or uh, ADGRG6, and, uh, and that is related to the normal function of the prion protein. But then actually, uh, well, this was the work of Alex Kufer, but then actually uh, uh, we have found uh, that other GPCRs also interact with N-terminus of PRP, and 
and it was as in La Carajo that has found another uh, adhesion GPCR, GPR 133, and uh, uh, this GPCR is negatively regulated by the prion protein. So if you add the end terminus of PRP, what you see is that you can actually push down uh, the levels of, um, um, of cyclic IMP, which is a readout for uh, GPR-133. So we made the knockout mice, we made slices from these mice, uh, and what you see is that, again, if you deliver prions to, uh, to wild-type slices, you destroy the slices. However, if you deliver prions uh, in fixed slices, that are GPR 133 knockout, the slides do not degenerate. So they partially, it's not completely, they, they, uh, the degeneration is attenuated, it's not completely prevented. So we believe that GPR 133 is a reasonable candidate for uh, transduction of toxicity, and uh, we we're still working on that. Now let me tell you about something about uh, selective vulnerability, and the problem is the following. Uh, if you infect neurons with prions, uh, the neurons die, and I've shown this to you. However, the thing is, uh, if you infect uh, more cell lines or many other c uh, tissues with prions, they can accumulate a lot of prions, uh, but nothing happens. Uh, and uh, uh, in some cells, you get some vacuolation. So then the idea was maybe here, uh, maybe there are, uh, um, uh, there are factors, uh, toxicity transducers, uh, that are lacking from uh, continuously growing cells, but are present in in, uh, neurons. So can we actually try find a way to actually look at uh, these factors? And uh, what I thought was uh, synthetic lethality. So you may consider that perhaps prions uh, are only toxic uh, together with the expression of something else. Uh, and, uh, and that was the work of Tinting Liu, who has done uh, a synthetic lethality CRISPR activator screen. So the CRISPR activator, the idea was to activate every single gene in the genome and find if something would lead to a dropout in, the, um, in, um, in any gene that would uh, then point to, um, uh, to synthetic lethality. And the, this is the protocol, so the cells were, um, were uh, um, made to express dead Cas9 fused to VPR66, to a trans, uh, 64 a trans activator, um, and then these cells would be either a prion infected or mock infected and transduced uh, with a geno genome-wide activation library, and then at various passages, uh, we do, uh, we, we looked for barcodes and for actually dropout. And you see that at the beginning, uh, the cells are very similar to each other, and then over time, you start seeing the differentially expressed genes. So we did all this, and it turns out that the dropout hits, so dropout hits are genes that disappear when uh, uh, overexpressed in the presence of uh, prion infection. And you see that actually most of these genes are actually, they are not in other organisms, they are in other organs. And uh, um, most, of, uh, most of the genes are expressed in the brain, and of those, most of the genes are expressed in neurons. And then we validated this uh, using, uh, uh, the, uh, validated the top hits uh, using, um, 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 uh, four guide RNAs, so, so plasmids that contain four guide RNAs, and uh, then we, again we looked at dropouts, and uh, these are the top hits, and this is very recent data. We have not looked a lot in detail at what these genes do, but actually two of them are quite nice because one is a one is a cysteine transporter and the other is a serotonin receptor. And the reason why uh, we focus uh, straight on those is very simple, is because it's possible there are chemical inhibitors for these two things. Uh, so we, we could actually validate this. And this is uh, the result. So again, control uh, slices uh, that versus prion infected slices. You see that uh, if you treat the slices simply with a vector, this is the beautiful uh, arbor vitae of the cerebellum, the granulocele layer. You see it's completely destroyed. However, if you give the inhibitor, sulfasalazine is an inhibitor for the cysteine transporter, and uh, this one is an inhibitor for 5-HT6, HT, HT, and you see that you very largely suppress the toxicity, and this is the quantitation. So this looks promising. So I believe that this type of dropout screens is actually very well suited to um, finding uh, uh, transducers of toxicity. Now, however, and this is uh, the final thing that I 
want to. Uh, I still have a couple of minutes, no? and uh, the uh, so and this is really what I want to um, um, uh, to tell you. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I think that probably the best thing is that you record my uh, talk and then you listen to it again at 0.5 speed. <laughs> and uh, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I know, I know. It's, I, I apologize, but <laughs> but uh, the uh, okay. But this this thing I really want to show to you. So. Uh, the thing is the following. Uh, I mean, m most people who do um, uh, CRISPR screens use pool libraries. And the pool library means that you have one impenetrable tube and you have 20,000 different lentiviruses in the same tube. Now, this is perfect for doing this type of uh, synthetic lethality screens that I've shown you because you just do, uh, uh, you just uh, read uh, the barcodes that have disappeared. But if you have something a bit more sophisticated, for example, um, biochemical assays, more Logical, high content S or non cell autonomous phenotype where you have two cell types, you can't do it with a pooled uh, library. So, what you need then is really, ar really arrayed libraries. So, I have been hoping for many years that somebody would take uh, uh, mercy and make these arrayed libraries, but this never happens. So, eventually, my postdoc, Janan Ian, has actually made uh, the library and he has made actually, he has constructed uh, more than 42,000 individual plasmids, and for that he has invented a way to make plasmids in very high throughput. And this is how the plasmid, what the plasmid contains, so it's a lentiviral construct that contains four different non-overlapping guide RNAs to one and the single gene. And so, and we replicated this for both CRISPR knockout and CRISPR activator, so altogether more than 42,000 plasmids, and the libraries are called Tispiezzo and Tigon which is Italian for I, I break you. This is, uh, the, this is the, the knockout uh, library, and Tigonfio means I blow you up. This is the activator library. And um, so, so this library worked incredibly well, and the first thing that we found is that uh, if you use single guides and you compare, so these are four, the four individual guides for some uh, uh, random genes, and you see that uh, there is activation, but very little. But if you, comp if you put together in one single plasmid four guides uh, uh, that are non-overlapping, you get a huge advance in the, in the activation. And the same thing happens for the knockout for the Tispiezzo library. And you see that the single guide can get you something like 15 to 20 percent uh, uh, knockout. But if you put them together, you get a, a 80, 90 percent uh, Knockout. So this works very well, but actually it became even better because while we were making this library, Jonathan Wiseman has published a method called CRISPR-Off, which where you essentially take a dead Cas9 fused to a methyl transferase, and then you can epigenetically silence whatever gene you're interested in. And because our CRISPR activator library contained guides directed against the promoter, we thought in the targeting window for CRISPR-Off is plus minus 500 uh, base pairs from the transcriptional start site, we thought that most likely the, our CRISPR activator could also work for CRISPR-Off. And in fact, this is uh, the position of our library of the various guides relative to the transcriptional start site, and this is the window of uh, opportunity for the, uh, the CRISPR-Off, for, uh, for the um, um, uh, epigenetic silencing. So this works... Uh, oops. So this works incredibly well, and in fact, here we look, uh, for example, at CD, uh, CD151, which is, again, randomly chosen, and you see here, this is non-targeting, there is a lot of expression. If you use, actually, the CRISPR activator guides uh, together with methyl transferase, you can essentially knock, uh, you can uh, switch off uh, almost 90% um, of uh, the cells. So this works very well. Now, we were worried about toxicity because, of course, for the CRISPR knockout, but, uh, you know, with four guys, you are making actually four double strand breaks. Uh, so, the, uh, so we were worried that this may actually kill the cells, but it doesn't. And here uh, we do a competition essay we, where we have green cells and red cells, and then we induce uh, uh, the knockout in one cell type, and we look actually at the, pre at, the pre at the ratio between the green and the red over time, and you see that uh, uh, if you knock out the essential genes, you have a drop in uh, viability as expected, but if you knock out non-essential genes, essentially nothing happens. So there is no, no um, toxicity that is nice. And uh, then we made all the viruses. And now 
uh, essentially, uh, yeah, I see that I have to, um, I have to wrap up. Uh, um, so I have approximately one million more slides to show, but uh, all, uh, <laughs> but um, but uh, but uh, let me just tell you that we are doing a lot of. Um, a lot of screens, uh, and uh, and now the, the great thing is that you can do things that were really not doable otherwise. And uh, the the important message here is that um, the. Uh, that running a, uh, a complete genome-wide screen for 20,000 genes, if you have a good assay, is not difficult, and uh, it's also not um, um, uh, it's also not uh, particularly um, uh, work-intensive. So it turns out, for example, here we ran a screen for uh, uh, any genes that control the expression of glucocerebrosidase, which is a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. And first of all, you can see that the discrimination between positive and negative is fantastic. Well, uh, we found a lot of hits, uh, which we are um, um, which we are currently uh, uh, characterizing. But uh, the whole screen uh, took less than two months. So we are talking about uh, a, a t an amount of work that is possibly even lower than that of, um, of a pooled screen. So we are very happy about this. And finally, I just want to mention that uh, uh, we are also running optical screens. Here we are um, doing an optical screen for modifiers of sinuclein aggregation. And, uh, the, and, here, and I want to show you what uh, uh, we are seeing here. So here we are. Uh, these are the negative controls. The blue guys are uh, non-targeting. Uh, uh, the yellow guys are, is a positive control, RAP13. But you have actually already find a bunch of genes that have a much stronger effect than the alleged positive controls. So, so, so we think this is really powerful. So bottom line, when you have a CRISPR library, pretty much um, um, uh, everything looks like a screamer phenotype. So um, currently we are uh, screening everything that moves. And, um, and uh, uh, but if you have some good ideas, uh, we really want to bring this to the people and uh, uh, share the love. Uh, so if you have um, something I mean, the important thing is you need to have a strong um, uh, readout. You have to have a good uh, reproducible essay with a big discrimination between positive and negative, and then you can do pretty good stuff with this. End of the story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Adriano. I'd love to let this discussion just just roll for a long time, but I think we're going to have to cut it off because people have to get trains and planes. So thank you very, very much. And I want to thank you. And I want I'll hand back to the organisers for wrap up. You want to say your goodbyes? Anybody? Aaron, you have nominated. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for a great week of science. Um, it was jammed packed, but I think we learned a lot and we made a lot of new friends. And I have a lot to uh, think about going back home, so please keep in touch with all of us. The dates for the next meeting are there, so while you can put it on your calendar, Wednesday, December 4th to Saturday, December 7th, 2024. Uh, looking forward to keeping in touch with everyone. Thanks for coming out. Safe travels.